In chapter eight, we review assessment techniques and how to create a therapeutic and safe clinical setting. In order to get the most from your textbook in chapter eight, recognize that this chapter focuses on providing information that sharpens your current assessment skills and will help you move from an LPN to an RN level. One of the things that you could do is create a concept map or a list of what you already know about physical assessment. Then as you're reading, add to those notes. Tie in the new information with your prior knowledge. This will help you remember the new things that you're learning. Focus on the techniques, the equipment use, and the order of assessment. You should collect your history and vital signs before you begin your physical exam. Gather your equipment and then enter the room. Your book lists a lot of equipment that you might need. In general, in our clinical this semester, things that you might use would be a stethoscope, a pen light, and things like an otoscope or an ophthalmoscope. You may use a tongue depressor to look in the throat or at teeth, a reflex hammer, or tuning forks to test for reflexes or hearing loss, vision screening tools, sensory items such as Q-tips, cotton balls, breaking of a, a Q-tip stick for a sharper item, a paper clip, skin marking pens and measurement tools are used for wound care, Hand sanitizer and gloves should always be at the ready to keep yourself and your patient safe. And if your patient is complaining of any sort of possible infection or contamination, culture tubes and sample collection kits should always be collected prior to going in. Not only is this more comfortable for your patient, but gathering your equipment first will maximize your time and help you stay organized and improve your flow. When you get to the bedside, the physical examination techniques that you use are going to be your best tools for gathering the objective assessment data. The four techniques that we use are inspection, palpation, percussion, and auscultation. Inspection is sight, sound, and smell. Palpation is what you can feel. Percussion is the listening externally of sounds caused by the striking of the skin or, or structures underneath the skin. And auscultation is listening with a stethoscope through the skin. Inspection begins as soon as you meet the patient and continues throughout the interaction. In order to properly inspect the patient, you need good lighting, it is purposeful and systematic, meaning that you're looking for very specific things. You're not just glancing at the patient and you're looking in a specific order so that you don't accidentally miss something. Careful examination of the whole person using your auditory, visual, and olfactory senses. <clears throat> you want to examine the color, the shape, the symmetry, and the position of body parts as you go along. Palpation, again, is the art of touching. There's light, deep, and bimanual palpation. In order to palpate the patient, you need clean hands. Remember that the expectation is that you will always wash your hands in front of the patient. So even if you put hand sanitizer on your hands in the hallway, as you're entering the room, you're drying your hands, as you're standing there talking to the patient, you ask them a couple questions and then you say, is it okay if I listen to your heart and lungs and you know, uh, assess your abdomen? You should then say, let me wash my hands before I care for you. That should be part of your everyday script in caring for patients. So clean hands, gloves only when you're touching something that is soiled or something that is contagious or something that's fairly private, like mucous membranes of the genitalia or uh, within the mouth. 
Light palpation is the surface assessment of the skin and the um, direct underlying structures. So you can assess things like the skin itself, lesions of the skin or directly underneath, um, injuries, the lymph nodes, you're feeling for the texture, the tenderness, temperature, moisture, elasticity, pulsations, superficial organs, and masses. Um, and you know, technically, you can kind of assess the uh, circulatory uh, vascular system at the same time. You depress anywhere from one half to three quarters of an inch with your finger pads while you're doing palpation, light palpation, and record both your sensory findings and the patient's reactions to the palpation. So make sure that if you're pushing on something to assess whether or not it hurts, that you're not focused solely on your hand, that you're also looking at the patient's face to determine whether or not they're grimacing or showing evidence of pain that maybe they're not verbally reporting. Deep palpation is used to feel internal organs and masses. And usually this is only done by the NP or the MD or with special permission at the RN level, only because if you are deeply palpating an organ that's at risk, you could cause internal bleeding or hemorrhage, or if it's a tumor or some sort of uh, cancer, you could cause spread of the disease. If you do do deep palpation, you're depressing further one half to two inches, firm deep pressure, and again, you're trying to feel the size, the shape, assess if there's tenderness, um, looking for symmetry and mobility of the object. Bimanual palpation is used when you're cupping your hands or using both hands around body parts to capture or envelop those body parts or organs. Um, and a good example of this uh, in your assessment book further on is the kidney. And then also for women, if you've ever had a bimanual um, exam when uh, they're doing the kind of internal vaginal exam and they're feeling your ovaries, that would be considered a bimanual exam as well, uh, ovaries and uterus. So one hand is, is in the vagina, the other hand is on the abdomen pushing down and they can determine then kind of the size and the location of the ovaries and the uterus. Again, not within our scope of practice. It's certainly not something I expect you to do in clinical. Percussion. So we're going to practice percussion, um, but percussion is uh, one of those tools that uh, some providers use quite a bit, some providers don't use at all, uh, but the majority of providers probably use on occasion for a couple things. So things that we do percuss. Um, we percuss kidneys. We percuss kidneys a lot to see whether or not, like, hey, does this hurt? And we, you know, we'll tap on it. Does that hurt? Um, sometimes we'll percuss the belly to see, you know, whether or not there's evidence of uh, perforation to see if the belly is um, distended or hard. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll percuss with a reflex hammer to see if we can elicit uh, reflexes, things like that. The practice of percussing organs um, is something that requires a lot of practice for real um, and uh, a very quiet environment because you're trying to discern a very subtle change in tissue density and sound um, so it's not something that you could necessarily hear in the middle of a busy ER but definitely can hear up on the floor um, so if you have somebody who has like a pneumonia or an enlarged liver um, or a, a bowel obstruction um, or a collection of fluid in the abdomen or the lungs, you know, uh, let us know in clinical and we would definitely, um, you know, percuss that area with you so you can understand the differences in sounds. So just in general, um, the, the, uh, higher pitched, short, um, and soft sounds tend to be over the denser organs and the lower pitched, louder and longer sounds tend to be over hollow areas. Um, and that's not always an absolute, but, but similar. Um, some sounds that you should recognize, timpani. So this is an NCLEX question that they love to ask, but if you percuss the abdomen, tympani is a normal finding over the stomach and the intestines because it's musical and drum-like over air-filled viscous, which would be organs like the stomach and the intestines. Um, it's a very long duration, loud, high-pitched, 
boom, boom, boom. Um, if you percuss the liver or the spleen, which is blood filled and completely solid, dense organ, it's going to be short, muffled, and a high pitched sound as if you're hitting like, you know, the stud in the wall and it's, boom, 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 you know, just a very soft, high pitched, short sound. Um, same thing if you percuss over uh, muscles or bone, it's just a very soft, high pitched, flat sound. Um, if you percuss over lungs that are full of air, you get this like big resonant sound. Um, not the same as timpani, but you know, you can kind of hear it almost like echoing. And then if you have um, the like children's lungs or disease lung like emphysema, you get a hyper resonant sound, which is just a lot louder and lower um, and more echoey. So those are the sounds that you might hear resonant, hyper resonant, tympanic, dull or flat. Uh, you know, is it super critical that you, um, you know, uh, percuss every single organ that you come across? No, absolutely not. But if you were in a setting where you didn't have x-ray and the patient complained of uh, fever, uh, chills, lack of appetite, some back pain, and you listened and you heard some crackles and you percussed and you heard, you know, dullness, then you could probably say they have pneumonia and treat them for pneumonia if you didn't have access to a chest x-ray. Auscultation is the use of a stethoscope or some sort of other device like a Doppler or something to listen to sounds within the body. And um, on your stethoscope, it has a diaphragm, which is the um, larger, flatter surface, and a bell, which is the hollower, smaller surface. Um, the diaphragm is used to listen to high-pitched sounds, which are most of our normal sounds, your lung sounds, your heart sounds, and your bowel sounds. Uh, the diaphragm then is used for normal sounds. So when you're listening to your heart and your lungs and your bowels, you should be listening with the diaphragm. The bell is used to pick up lower pitch sounds, and most of those are your abnormal sounds. So your bruise in your neck um, or in, over your blood vessels, like in your abdomen or your femoral area, um, murmurs in the heart and extra heart sounds should be auscultated with the bell. So during your normal physical exam, you should always start with the diaphragm, and if you hear something abnormal, flip to the bell and listen with the bell. And then make sure you flip back before you keep going on with the rest of your auscultation. So just some tips. Alter your priorities based on the patient age, condition, and complaint. So ensure safety and comfort. If somebody comes in and they're having extreme difficulty breathing, I'm not going to do a full head to toe examination. I'm going to put them in the position of comfort. I'm going to ensure that they have adequate ABCs. I'm going to do a very rapid focused exam, including listening to their heart sounds and lung sounds after I get their vital signs. And I'm going to care for the immediate complaint. Then once I have stabilized them, I can go back and do the rest of their physical exam. The same is true on the floor. When you go in in the morning and you meet your patient, what you want to do is make sure that you've met your patient, you have consent, you do your vital signs and a very quick assessment. So you want to like determine their mental status, their airway, their breathing, their circulation, listen to their heart and lungs, maybe quickly some bowel sounds, um, you know, uh, palpate their abdomen lightly to make sure that there's no pain and make sure that they can move all four extremities and then come back and finish your physical exam when you're doing your bath or care or you know you're getting them out of bed or whatever so that you can really do a thorough skin assessment but there's there's no rule that says that you have to do 15 minute physical examinations on every single patient before you could move on. If you did that and you were taking care of seven patients, you wouldn't see your seventh patient until two hours into your shift. And so if there's something wrong with that patient, you wouldn't see them until way too late. So it's okay to just do a quick two minute checkup and then come back for more detail.
document as clearly as possible in proper medical terms and as soon as possible. Please don't leave your documentation for later. The sooner you can put it into the computer, the more accurate it's going to be because you're not going to forget important things. Um, two other things. IPPA. I perfectly perform assessments. Inspection, palpation, percussion, and oscillation. IAPP. I ate a pretty peach. When you assess the, abdom the abdomen, the abdominal order is inspection and then oscillation before palpation and percussion or percussion and palpation technically um, because once you palpate the abdomen you increase bowel sounds so if the person had hypoactive bowel sounds um, or even normal active bowel sounds once you do your percussion and palpation you are going to end up with uh, hyperactive bowel sounds potentially and a skewed examination. Um, so those are my best tips on patient assessment. Make sure that you understand how you're going to do um, all of those assessment techniques. Look through the rest of the chapter on how to use um, all of your equipment and on how to um, safely set up and address the clinical setting. So on pages 121 through uh, 126, it just goes over um, safety and the proper uh, sequence for providing your assessment to different ages. Thanks.